Welcome to Franchise Killer, a podcast where we pick movie franchises or one of your franchises, review them film by film, and see where things went wrong. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I'm disappointed. I, I'm, I'm disappointed. This is David's mini series. Why did you look at me? All right. That said, <laughs> Robin Williams is extremely hard to replicate. Well, you just do any sort of accent, and he's probably done it. What are you talking about? I am Robin Williams. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like that's okay, how hard that's, that? that that speaks about how good he is, but that's not actually his voice. Yeah, yeah, he's all about impressions. You have mm. to do an impression that Robin Williams did an impression of. True, mm-hmm. I know, but it, 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 I feel like that's doable. You know, or you can do a Mork and Mindy, you know, kind of voice. Yeah, I'm Reese. Across from me, we have David. To his left, Irina. To my right, Jafar. Also known as Noah. Was that Jafar? J- Jafar. J- Jafar. A little, a little lower, it, lower register. That was the live action Jafar. Jafar. <laughs> that was the oh, live yeah, action Jafar. Well, and the diamond in the rough himself. AJ. The movie we're talking about tonight is, of course, Aladdin. The 1992 Disney animated film. The fourth film in the Disney renaissance. And uh, the third by... Uh, John Musker and Ron Clements. They are. They actually kind of ruled D- Disney animation for two to three decades. Did uh, before this one, The Great Mouse Detective and The Little Mermaid. Uh, I guess I should go into what else they've done since I've jumped the gun already. I think it's a good already. idea. I think it's a great uh, idea. But yeah, they did The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, Hercules, Treasure Planet, The Princess and the Frog, and Moana, and of course the movie we're talking about tonight. Just a Aladdin. couple movies. Just a, yeah, not really, cl- kind of lesser known yeah. Disney fair. Those, you know. Indie that, movies. I kind of lump those in with the Black Cauldron and <laughs> uh, just, we, Little Mermaid, what's that? Come on. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're big. Yeah. I would say they are, they are some of the, when you think of a big Disney movie, they're almost always involved. Yes. Uh, the movie stars. Well. Yes. Yeah. And they, these these two are inseparable. They're just every and, and it is funny. They actually did kind of work on the Black Cauldron. So when I said that, there's <laughs> somewhat relevant. They, they weren't the directors, but I think they were maybe like animators. Yes. Yeah, or storyboarders yeah. or something like that. And then you've got the other famous Disney duo, Ted Elliott and Terry Rosio, who were also involved, I think, on the screenplay of this. Yeah, they're everywhere. Like I when I saw their names, I was like, really? These guys again? Like <laughs> they're they're all over the place. And in so many of the movies that we've talked about, like Pirates of the Caribbean, they were involved in that one, The Road mm-hmm. to El Dorado, a lot of the yep. DreamWorks movies, a lot of the Disney movies. They they're just they are all over the place. Uh the movie stars Scott Wanger, or the or stars the vocal talents of Scott Wanger, uh Robin Williams, Linda Larkin, Jonathan Freeman, Frank Welker, Gilbert Gottfried, and Douglas Seal. Uh, strangely enough, uh, Robin Williams actually didn't want to be credited as the uh, in, in this movie for some weird. How like, can you not be credited when you're kind of driving we'll, the flow of this we'll movie? We'll talk about it. We'll talk. Yeah, about we'll talk. It. We'll talk about it. But yeah, it's kind of odd because he's like such a, a a force in this movie. Like mm-hmm. this is the one I'd want to be credited for. Uh, but yeah, we will get into that screenplay again. I already we already kind of went over it. But Ron Clements, John Musker, Ted Elliott, and Terry Rosio. You know, a lot of people touched this script up. And it's based on Aladdin and the Magic Lamp from uh, 1001 Nights. Uh, Arabian Nights, Arabian specifically. And, and was it originally in that? I don't know. Was it? Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> what? You like, looked at me like... I'm I sorry. Know. Wait. Explain. Well, I was answering your question, but apparently I'm wrong. No. I'm, so I've, I've read that book, or at least a compilation of those stories, and it is in there. It's just not set in... The location they chose here. Okay, so I don't know if this is necessarily I, Wikipedia, um, <laughs> so I'll take that with a grain of salt. But I heard that it wasn't in the original One Thousand and One Nights, and it was added in the late eighteen hundreds from a French guy who. Oh like, yeah, added well, that it. Is he true. added it to the book later. It wasn't originally a part of it. I think mm. in that rendition, it was set in China. Yeah. Not uh, Arabia. Interesting. That's so strange. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, for those that are new to this show, on this podcast, we first go over our thoughts on the film before revisiting it for the episode, then we dive into the story, break it down bit by bit, and talk about the more significant moments. Then towards the end of the show, we give our brief reviews and numbered scores, along with an analysis on the health of the franchise and whether or not this film hurt it. So guys, (laughs) had we seen Aladdin before the viewing for this episode? Uh, let's start with you, David. 
I think this might be up there as one of the most watched Disney movies of my childhood. I think we were discussing this beforehand, um, what our top Disney movies were. I have very strong memories of being at my grandparents. Um, my grandfather would watch this with me, and uh, he would always do uh, the Robin Williams genie impression. <laughs> I always remember him whenever he got to, uh, when the ru- when he and the, the rug are playing chess, he's like, I can't believe I'm losing to a rug. <laughs> doing like a, a, a danger field sort Runny of impression. danger field, yeah. That's cool. Um, I did kind of want to do this. Yeah, like we all had our collection of Disney movies that we would, you know, cycle through that would be on heavy rotation. And I do want to get like a quick like, where was this in the amount of times that you watched? Like like compared to the other Disney movies that we all watched, uh, where would you place this? In, in my watched like mo- most watched Disney movie, where does it fall? Number one or number two? It's either this or Tarzan. It just depends on the year. I feel like maybe Aladdin overall, just because I started watching it and it kind of made its way through a staple in my grandparents' house. Whereas Tarzan, when I first watched it, it was like a lot at once for a short period of time. Made its way through a staple. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, Arena. Yeah, I think this was probably just under Hercules for me, as far as how how much I had watched it. And Hercules is in what kind of area? Uh, like, uh... It's hard to say. It's hard. <laughs> it's in Greece. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, actually, Olympus. So I think Hercules we actually owned, um, but I, I think the reason I probably didn't see this one as much is because I don't think we actually owned the film because this was back with, you know, VCRs and everything. Yeah, I think your memory's a lot better than mine, because I don't remember specifically all the ones we owned. Like, I thought we had Aladdin, yeah. but I guess not. Well, I think I, I remember because there was a, I had a huge disappointment knowing that, oh, I can't watch these when I want to. I yeah. have to go back and watch go Ariel now, <laughs> because we had Ariel, Little and, Mermaid. And renting a movie is always a process where you have to you know, yeah. ask the parents. You may or may not get it. Yeah. We'll see. I remember, yeah. uh, I think... Uh, Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast, we didn't actually directly own. Mm -hmm. We used to at one point, but then we lost it, I guess, and we would rent those. So they were always a special occasion when we got to see it. Yeah. So Aladdin kind of squarely in the middle of the pack there. Uh, Noah? I really don't know. I mean... So you had seen it, obviously. Yeah. So we get that out of the way. Definitely seen it. Don't know where it ranks as far as how much i've watched because i didn't really watch a ton of uh every single disney movie every i mean you know you'd have hercules and that one is easy to watch whether it's your favorite one or not Mm -hmm. so that was probably on quite a bit and i remember watching emperor's new groove quite a bit but that's not quite the same Mm -hmm. i i would have to say middle mid, mid range yeah all right, and AJ. Uh, this is easy, Aladdin, no question. Uh, so yes, I had seen it several times, and number one for me. Number one, most watched, heavily, most heavily rotate in the rotation of of Disney viewings. So yeah, for me, this is probably in the top five, even though we didn't own it. It still kind of occupies that same space along with the 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 ones that were most formative for me. Although I'd, pro- I'd probably say it's at the bottom of the top five for me personally. Right. But yeah, I- iconic Disney movie. It's almost hard to watch a movie like this because you just know every... Or it's hard to watch it from a different perspective because it's so kind of mm-hmm. just it's, in It's all there. familiar. You yeah. have it all memorized pretty much. It's like, how do I even yeah. objectively view this thing and critique it? But we're going to try. <laughs> uh, with that said, David... You ever call to action there? I sure do. Let me uh, pull out my scroll. Get this know. train back on the tracks because no, no. I've, I've derailed us. <laughs> Are you <laughs> seeing Arabian Nights real quick? Get in the Arabian Nights. Follow our podcast. That's... Five stars on Apple. And review us and follow us on YouTube and Instagram too. D- David's... <laughs> I was actually... You, you started to... Curl further within yourself. I know as that went I, on, it like, didn't work. I, I was surprised I that you makes hadn't our listener, started singing earlier. <laughs> yeah, it makes our listeners want to cut off their ear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Just gosh. the one. Uh, yeah. Hey, no, no, that that's not PC. We're we're gonna take that little, out. Little meta joke there. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's something they had to cut out. That's true. Yes, I cut um, it out. That was actually early, early on. Yeah, uh, but yeah, what David was was trying to say is that um, that five stars on Apple helps us out a lot. Uh, we're also on YouTube. We're on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, anywhere you can uh, drop us a comment or give us a review helps. Uh, so yeah, it puts us up there. It puts us up there. Also, we have a Patreon that still does not exist, but it, it will someday. And there may be a time when you listen to this episode and hear me say this, and it actually will be up. So check that thing out. Steve, we have, I know you're listening. Steve, it's up. Yeah, we'll have bonus reviews. I mean, uh, sorry, bonus episodes, awards shows, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, we've actually like backlogged like almost th- wait three awards shows and some other random bits and bobs like extended episodes and all that. Uh, so that'll all be there on the Patreon when that finally does release. Uh, so yeah, look forward to that. With all that said, Noah, you want to give us that story? I think there's something written here. Ten thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck. Say the magic word. Genie, I wish for you to make me a prince. He has the lamp. We're never gonna get a hold of that lamp. Oh, that hurts. Do you trust me? Keep your hands and arms inside the carpet. We out of here. Near the city of Agrabah, there lies the Cave of Wonders. Only one is worthy to enter, the diamond in the rough. Jafar, a royal vizier and sorcerer of sorts, seeks a lamp from within and finds that Aladdin, a street urchin, is the one who is worthy. Meanwhile, Princess Jasmine of Agrabah is upset that she must marry a prince instead of marrying for love, so she takes a day off from the palace, gets into trouble with a merchant, and must be saved by none other than Aladdin. There's an instant connection, but Aladdin is imprisoned by Jafar. Jasmine confronts Jafar, demanding Aladdin's release, to which Jafar claims Aladdin has been executed. Later, a disguised Jafar sets Aladdin free and guides him to the cave. Aladdin finds a magic carpet and the lamp and takes it back to Jafar. He is then betrayed and left for dead. Luckily for him, Aladdin's little buddy Abu, a sneaky monkey, had stolen the lamp back from Jafar. Aladdin, with no other option rubs the magic lamp, and out comes a big blue Robin Williams. <laughs> I was thinking something else was Yeah, I was there. a little, where are you going there, Noah? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It is uh, what it is. Uh, so, obviously, it, this movie's instantly iconic. I feel like when, the moment it starts, it's like, yep, mm. this is the Arabian Nights song. We have all that kind of set up. What, Robin Williams is doing the voice of this guy who's narrating them not narrating the beginning but he's uh i think it would be considered narrating he is sort of like setting up the movie as a story yeah we get the iconic arabian night song uh and then our intro to jafar as he's taking this guy out to the um what's it called the cave of wonders mm-hmm. the guy takes his first step down the steps and gets swallowed of my slumber yeah, great setup. Like, what I do like about this movie is you don't see Aladdin until 11 or 12 minutes in. Like, it's a good chunk of, like, you know, setting up this world, doing the world building, and then we're introed to Aladdin. Uh, those, those, What do you all think about the intro to this movie? How, where are we at here? I, I think it's an interesting choice to sort of use Robin Williams as, like, the the traveling salesman to set up the story. I feel like there are very few, I, I don't know, it feels like very few movies set it up that way. And I really like it. I think it works. I think maybe, I mean, we all saw the, the Disney Plus, you know, little intro screen where they say, you know, there's a lot of politically incorrect things. 
um, in the movie. But I, that feels like maybe one of them. And but I, yeah. I think it. That's, and that was one. The, there was a line taken out from that scene that was especially controversial. Oh, was it? Uh, yeah, I think that's the reference that uh, AJ was making earlier uh, to the cutting off the ears and all that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. That although well, that happened like, literally the year after release, like '93. But and then right. they've made a couple other, I think, uh, edits since then, more recently. Yeah, I I think that's the risk you run when you have a comedian kind of dictating their own lines you know because comedians always seem to be on this other level where you're not quite sure what they're allowed to get away with yeah you know so i i think that's just kind of part of the risk with this movie as well as kind of using this landscape as a fictional realm rather than a real place you know where Mm -hmm. it's sort of alluding to uh things you're familiar with but kind of taking their own like twist on that fairy mm-hmm. tale twist so it, i think that's what makes it complicated oh, it's why in they trying to revise too. it yeah but uh ultimately i i think i can remember being a kid and um watching this movie for the first time and the kind of this music that comes in for arabian nights was one of my favorites where you know it's kind of mm-hmm mystical and you're excited to see what happens it it feels um i, I don't I know how say to the describe score it is inspiring the, the scores by uh, alan minkin mm-hmm. so i i really the- love the the music already starting off really strong and kind of unlike anything you've heard before and it has that this foreign aspect where you know as a kid you're excited to see what happens mm-hmm. and i Sorry, I was, go I was gonna say with the intro music that that one specifically as well I think was written by Howard Ashman, which we've talked about in uh, previous episodes, and this was his last movie. Um, yeah, he's known for you know the other big words such as um, Little Mermaid. I think he yeah he did that was his first movie, and then uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty, not Sleeping Wild, not Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> his first <laughs> movie was Little Mermaid, and then he went back <laughs> in time to <laughs> Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty and the Beast. Um, so yeah, he did Beauty and the Beast, uh, and then he he died in the middle of making this one, but he. Yeah. He did the he put a lot of work Arabian in. Nights intro song. So this this is one of those Disney movies that I feel like if these songs were not good, the movie would just fall apart. It's got a good oh, yeah. story. It still has a good story, but mm. the songs are just. I would. S- I disagree. I would say this is the one that has me most immersed in its world, mm. and the music really helps. Right. But I think it's more the I, atmosphere. I think I, they're every yeah. single one of the songs in this, whether you like each song or not, is iconic and yeah. instantly recognizable. It is. it is, but I don't think that means the movie itself is lesser because the songs are so good. I th- I think what uh, makes this a good story, too, is that they actually focus on creating a three-dimensional male character for once, mm-hmm. where for the most part, they've been kind of cookie-cutter. Where it's yeah. just like, I'm a prince, or like, I'm a dude, and I'm attractive, and I like this woman. Save princess, kiss in sleep. And yeah. they, they kind of have that plot line still, but or alternate like, romantic plot line, but it's Not they at simple. least tried to give him a personality. Yeah, I, I think this yeah. was Disney's effort to finally like bring boys back in, where... Boys are back in well, town. No, Disney <laughs> was uh, known as like, they do, they do a lot of princess movies at this point. Right. All the previous ones are very... You know, they, they the demography of children that would watch these movies were, I feel like it was more skewed towards girls. Muskers yeah. and Clements are like, we need more boys. What Disney is always aiming for is ha- being a four quadrant movie where right. it's like it appeals to adults, kids, older people, everybody. They were ha- getting kind of struggling bringing boys in because they, they're, like, they're not interested in, you know, princesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they want guys with swords and, the, the, in, and who they can identify with, not the right. boring prince charming who has zero personality whatsoever. Yeah. So we get a movie that has both a you know male protagonist, but we also get our Disney princess. Yes. Right. Uh, AJ, I, I felt like you were going to say something there. Yeah, and you're spot on. And the literal kind of 3D visuals. I mean, the whole Cave of Wonders is so iconic right off the bat, and it gives you that right. sense of this is more like larger than life you know you have the the chase of the scarab which you know didn't make it in the live action but that's neither here nor there yeah um and and we're going back to you, the the world building i'm guessing it's yeah, yeah. so world building and just the immersion and you know 
we create the setting that has this magic, but also, you know, is foreign to a lot of people in North America, but is also identifiable. There's the magic and mystery, but also, you know, putting yourself in, well, not Aladdin's shoes because he's barefoot, but... Um, <laughs> His, Under, does he wear yeah. sandals at some point? He's, he, when he's a prince, he's got some little shoes on. No, that's Slippers. Prince Ali. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's um, it's just, it draws you your attention in and right away, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, we get our, we're introduced to Aladdin. We get the first musical number with our, um, what's his name? Does he do the voice of, of both? Aladdin and the, the no, singing no, no. voice? Two different people. Okay. Uh, his name is uh, Scott Wanger. Um, he does the voice, not the not the singing. Yeah. Yeah, but we kind of are introduced to this this uh our titular Aladdin, and he's got Abu and they're they're street rats. And we get that whole that that first song. I do kind of do want to get a sense of where everyone's at with each song. Because mm-hmm. I feel like we each maybe probably have our favorites. Right. This one I like it as an as a great establishing song, but it's not towards the top for me. It's like kind of a middle middle song. It's it establishes the character well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I like it. it it's a as I said, th- I think this movie is so reliant on the musical side of things. I I know the world's interesting, but there's just so many just banger disney songs in this movie like mm-hmm. even the ones that are t- towards the lower end for this one right for me like if this song were in another disney movie it might be towards the higher end mm-hmm. like i just think like this it, it's so musically driven and so well choreographed throughout the whole thing uh it, it's and, and i think that's why out of all the disney remakes the aladdin remake he it skews the most closely to this one yeah because it's just designed to be like it like what is aladdin without its music like i feel like yeah. they they could change mulan because there's like maybe one or two iconic songs in mulan yeah there aren't as many in mulan yeah but in aladdin it's like five yeah. or six or seven yeah and yeah. alan uh Menken returned for a lot of the live actions who and he's so he's a disney veteran as well right um yeah and you know we don't want to rely on comparing too heavily to the live action although i'm sure it's going to come up but Shameless self-promotion. If you do want to see more about that, head over to screenpunk.net, our parent site, uh, where I've got actually a write-up on the live-action remake. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Check it out. Yeah, but uh, I you, mean... You, you wanted to know where we are as yeah. far as like the, all these musical numbers. And when you're talking about these movies, especially during this time, um, the musical numbers were basically tied with the characters like this is how you got to know your characters like any musical that you would Mm. go to see they all have their like this is who i am this is what i want in life song Mm. and this was for aladdin and i i agree with you that it's maybe not the top of the list as far as the best songs in this i actually have one that i find lower than this and we'll bring it up when we get to that one whole new world uh, we'll bring it up when we get to that one. <laughs> um, but I, I actually like the song. I think it's fun. It's It establishes his character. And I I think this was one of those uh, f- few films where, as a kid going into it, I thought, oh, yeah, this is a boy's movie. But this is just as appealing to girls, speaking for myself, where it's mm-hmm. like there's also just the color scheme for me, has always been a very attractive look where they use a lot of blues and oh, oranges yeah. I and love yellows. The color, the color. Oh, yeah. It's, the it's color just palette, the look of treasure. <laughs> the color palette for me, I, I absolutely loved. So, um, yeah, I, I have no problem with this song. I like it mm. a lot. Uh, I also like, for musicals, which I'm going to call this a musical, even though it is an it's animated... It's a Disney movie. They're musicals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like it when the music tells a story versus everyone just stopping from the plot to just dance yeah. around and sing and then, okay, now we're done, continue the plot. <laughs> this one, what most great Disney musicals do is they progress plot through right. the music. Like As it actually, should be. Yeah, actually, they're telling a story through it. They're progressing the story. And every yeah. single one of these musical numbers are pivotal to telling you something important about the story while getting your toes tapping yeah. like it, and just enjoying yourself. So, uh, yeah. yeah, kudos to that. I feel like but people's problem... Sorry, go ahead. 
Well, go ahead. I, I was just going to say some people's problem with a musical numbers that are like that, the ones you say are really annoying, is kind of like the same problem people have with excessive fight scene sequences or mm -hmm. car chases in other films. It's just this feels like a whole bunch of fluff, which maybe to a certain kind of person is enjoyable, but it's not helping me progress through the story. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and that's your, that's an astute observation because I feel like if the action or the car chase is exceptionally done mm -hmm. and you love it, you don't care how long yeah, it is as long yeah. as it's amazing. Yeah. Exactly. But you can't, if you have nothing to say or nothing impressive to show, then... Why, why is this dragging on this I line? know, right? But, but no. there's also the logic AJ. that... Uh, no, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No. What were you saying, AJ? Oh, I was going to say, I think one jump ahead is kind of important because it has a, a good balance mm -hmm. with moving things forward and establishing exactly. setting and plot, but then immediately as it cuts off, it, it kind of uh, decrescendos, and then we see a character developing moment where he shares the bread with the right. orphan mm -hmm. children or the, the other uh, street urchins or you know abandoned children, what have you. Yeah. Um, so he's got this kind of lightheartedness and adventure spirit, but then also deeply cares about, you know, yeah. other people. Mm -hmm. I, I think that his uh, character is very interesting, whether they intended this or not. But the progression of these scenes, the musical number into a sobering moment like that is almost like because of the kind of life he lives, he has to be upbeat. He has to be like smiling and just kind of taking everything as a joke, you know, in a way just to even get by. So having a sobering moment like that is just, oh, okay, yeah, this this life is harsh, but he's sort of, you know, bringing that energy to get through it. Yeah. So I, I like that mm -hmm. aspect. Go jumping after one jump ahead, when we do get to see his character development with the bread, I like that it also shows that Abu, the, the monkey compatriot, is kind of just like he's not on the same empathetic wavelength that Aladdin is. <laughs> like no, he, I he's feel a like little less eager to give the bread. He's to like, the kids. he's like, we just stole this for us, bro. <laughs> like this is yes. our bread. Yeah, <laughs> he does that throughout the movie, and I think that's really funny. Um, but he's also learning and and adjusting with Aladdin. He knows what's right and always goes along with it. But it's he's different also than a most. monkey. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and that's how monkeys are. You know. Uh, yeah. So Aladdin runs into Jasmine, who is kind of escaped from the palace mm -hmm. and wants to explore the streets and see what this, this other side of life is because she's felt cooped up in this palace mm -hmm. and the sultan's trying to you know hook her up with various suitors uh you know what i mean this yeah. is but one of the better interpretations i would say of that trope of the girl wanting to marry for love instead of uh yeah you see it a lot yeah you definitely see it a lot but i think it's well established here we get this moment like right after the musical number and the it, just another thing I want to say about these animated movies is the, they're so economically paced. So mm -hmm. every scene has to be very intentional because these movies cost so much and so much work has to go into everything. So everything's so well calculated. So he meets Jasmine at exactly the right time that he should, where it's just all of this seems like it's every moment feeds perfectly into the next one. Right. It's all seamless. Uh, and, as as I said, economic. So you get to you learn a little bit about Jasmine on her side. You learn a little bit about Aladdin on his side, and then they convene in this I don't yeah. know scene. And there's a right. and I love the movement of the animation too. Mm. It's very uh, it doesn't seem like it's the like the most uh, what's the word elaborate uh, decadent Disney movie ever made. But it is, it, it's got a scrappiness to it that I like. That it, it, I don't know. It, it, I guess it just doesn't look like the most expensive of expensive Disney movies, but I think that kind of works for it. I don't know if I'm... I... I mean, no, I think you're right. There's there's something about that's more down to earth than other Disney movies. And it doesn't feel like a super high budget movie. Um, I, although I do wonder where some of the money goes to. Perhaps Robin Williams... No, no, he took a pay decrease on this, I believe. Yeah, he yeah, did not get paid a lot at all. Yeah, he yeah. didn't get paid a lot at all. Maybe I have the differing opinion here. I think this one's pretty extravagant compared to its counterparts. I think it's well, vibrant. When... The, yeah. the color yeah. palette is, is, is very, you know, poppy. And we kind of saw an imitation almost in El Dorado, or Road to El Dorado. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is kind of an iconic... I mean, you look at, um, you know, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King. They all have kind of distinct... Uh, mm -hmm. vibrant 
color saturation, but this really kind of ups that a little bit. Oh, yeah. But I get that it's not like overly detailed or trying to be um, pushing the envelope as far as that regard. Although I think they did a little bit of. Yeah, they did a little bit with uh, the Cave of Wonders Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Carpet, um, where there's a little bit of kind of 3D ish mapping, but. It, it blends well. I think is what you're getting at is it doesn't seem like they're trying to push the envelope for the most part. Right. Yeah. It's Speaking actually having it's fun. And, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, Reese and I got into an argument about that Cave of Wonders 3D uh, sequence when he's doing his little roller coaster carpet ride. Mm-hmm. Um, Reese over here complaining about how it doesn't look as good. It's on our 4K screens and the fact that it was 1992 and they didn't even have like good 3D modeling for these kind of movies. They had the the the, the curved glass screens at the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, let me speed us up in the plot real quick so then we can have that argument. Cause the, yeah. uh, so we, we let's quickly talk about Sultan and Jasmine, two characters we haven't really discussed yet. We gave Al- Aladdin a lot of time, but... What are our what are, what are y'all's thoughts on Linda Larkin as Jasmine and uh, Jonathan Freeman as Jafar and the Sultan and then Sultan yeah yeah I guess it's Sultan too uh, uh, we got uh, Douglas Douglas Seal as the Sultan how dare you insult the him? Sultan for me always was kind of forgettable he was just kind of like you know, a goofy Sultan that is very distanced from everything that's happening yeah. I <laughs> almost don't know if he of... knows how to do his his job. <laughs> he's just kind of stupid. Like well, he's very sweet. I love him. He is dumb, but he's fun and he's good-hearted enough. Where <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah you exactly. realize that he's been being manipulated, especially with the hypnosis thing. But oh yeah, he's never like the the state of things is never an ill intent. Right, right. But my my mm. point is, he's never like memorable, and I don't think that's important. I but think it's, he's uh, got a kiddish nature, especially when he rides he carpet. Um, he always reminds is, is me fun. of. He always reminds me of the father in Tarzan, the um, oh, yeah. Jane's father. Mr. Porter. Yeah. Um, but I love Jafar because he's so oily and creepy yes. and sinister and just kind of... Snakeish. Yeah, very snakeish. And every time he's on screen, you're like, yep, that's the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's, also gotta, yeah. he's also got to be like top five iconic Disney villain like yeah. from a look stand like oh just, yeah looks no. alone that you see the silhouette of Jafar you know exactly what it is like it's he's yep, that, he, he's very powerful I mean he's a sorcerer and I think right. the original source like he's from you know kind of Morocco area so he's still kind right. of foreign an interloper and, and another thing they do with the animation like every character model is based on a different kind of shape structure so that adds right. this really mm-hmm. diverse um kind of a feel to everyone as well but yeah definitely i'd say i mean he's usually in my top he's probably my number one disney villain in terms of you know ability power and um i this is a big thing in my personal book is um you know the strength of an antagonist is directly correlated in most cases to the antagonist yeah Yeah. and Mm -hmm. jafar is definitely up there and that makes aladdin's story that much stronger because um, yes he's really up against this actual threat yeah well his character jafar's uh design was actually based a lot of of, um maleficent like a lot of his design was that's Mm -hmm. exactly where they were coming from um i believe they even tried to like you know match sort of the curvature of his hat with the horns Um, i see a lot of scar in him like i yeah, I that's kind of like the facial hair a little bit. Well, it's it's the it's some of the expressions and kind of like the half lidded look sometimes yeah. when mm-hmm. they're kind of looking condescendingly at someone. Like that's where I get the scar. But when you watch his movement, it is very maleficent like, kind of the way he moves his hands and is always kind of standing up straight and ever so slightly bending mm-hmm. over as he talks. Like it's. Yeah very similar when you watch them side by side. Yeah. And I think that's they're going for that kind of regality, that composed nature that they have, which ironically does not last in the end, but yeah. Well at the same time he's got that true villain deranged cackle. Right. Like the mm-hmm. perfect Yeah. He definitely yep, lets talk- out a little cackle there. And now we can talk about Jasmine. Yeah. I like Jasmine. I I don't know. I, I, I was expecting someone I, else to I, say something. <laughs> I I agree. I think Jasmine's great. She's strong probably my female, favorite yeah. yeah, female lead in Disney or yeah, kind of. She's not exactly a damsel in distress. I'm a damsel. Yeah. 
she has strength and purpose in her own mm-hmm. identity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even like though I think she's like out, 16, but yeah. 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 Her going out to the, uh, to live on the streets, actually committing to her decision is what is, uh, cool. Cause I, I don't know. I always felt it was cheap and she's never a pushover. She's kind of pushing against conventions of the, mm-hmm. of the time, mm-hmm. uh, where it's like, oh, you're going to be married off. And she's like, well, I don't want to be married off. That's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, don't I'm speak gonna... for me. Yeah. I won't be exactly. speechless. Like, you know. oh God. <laughs> she she has an emotional strength too where i yeah. there are a lot of disney movies where you know the ones where the the female protagonist has kind of like a mental breakdown at some point and throws herself at the bed or the mm. couch or mm-hmm. something yes. and starts crying and she never has a scene like that ever yeah no, like <laughs> she's, she's she's not that and like she does weep a little bit but uh it, it's really nice cuz she Decides, you know what, I'm going to go back, but in order to save Aladdin from she's, yeah. you know, imprisonment. For the uh, few times you see her, they establish her character very well, and she's very balanced. Mm-hmm. So I, without being too antagonistic towards, uh, sorry, I hear Sky mm-hmm. yelping. But um, the, I think sometimes... When movies try to course correct as far as their female leads, where they don't want them to be like a stereotypical female, Mm -hmm. they almost make them too aggro, you know, Mm -hmm. like a little too uptight. And with her, this is a believable female protagonist that actually stands up for herself. And I I really like it. And even when she is like for a brief period of time, a quote unquote damsel in distress, well, I'll just say damsel because she she never acts in distress, <laughs> really. Yeah, not really. Uh, but she even shows agency in that moment when uh, Aladdin's coming to save her. She's like, okay, I'm going to try and seduce the Sultan to take his yeah. eye away. And, yeah. You know, uh, and but- and if you're calling her technically a damsel, Aladdin also is a damsel until he's saved by genie True. a couple <laughs> times. So and you, if is- you're, people have to be saved. It's just a thing that happens. Yeah, this is a, a really good example of organic building of a, you know, female character where, mm, yeah. you know, like Irina said, now it's kind of over the top, unfortunately, in a lot of cases in an effort to course correct or overcorrect because of social, you know, trends and that kind yeah. of thing. But here it's 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 well done. And an important character that's often overlooked is Raja, you know, or Tiger, yeah. yes. because it, you know, mirrors her personality as Abu mirrors a lot of Aladdin's personality. And just mm. the fact that she has this strength in her relationship with Raja, you know, it, it literally shows her strength of character. Yeah. Also, I like that the the kind of flipping on its head of like, oh, a guy should have a bigger, more uh, masculine side, you know, pet character companion. No, she gets the big old tiger and he gets <laughs> the little monkey. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, I kind of like that flip as well. Um I'm then sorry. you've got Iago, voiced by Gilbert Gottfried, another iconic yeah. voice in this role, uh, who, you know, kind of almost clashes in um, relationship or, you know, in juxtaposition with Jafar. But, mm-hmm. you know, they mimic each other's, or, you know, Iago parrots a lot of the mannerisms of Jafar um, that are is less polished, but it kind of is that self serving, self important kind of thing that Jafar has underneath the, you know, sinister. Uh, serpentine aspects of him right mm. is is this the disney movie with the most main characters who have pet or animal companions i didn't I hadn't realized it until now there's three the three main characters all have their animal yep i didn't i didn't even think about that until you said that aj i'm not sure uh, i feel like as far as uh the way you're talking about their animal familiars was making me think about iago's relationship with jafar and Iago is almost like there to be his hype man. So like Jafar is vizier to the Sultan. And so to some degree, like you can tell he thinks of himself as all high and mighty and, Mm. you know, the most powerful there is. And he doesn't get that credit because he has Mm -hmm. to pretend to be, you know, subservient. And so Iago is there to be like his ego almost, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's kind of interesting when you think about it that way he voices the self-important thoughts that the cool exterior of jafar 
right you know, silences himself because of his, his you know political maneuverings right but it it still echoes his inner i guess turmoil for lack of a better word Oh, that's pretty cool to think about. Yeah. I, I like the fact that originally they were going to have Iago be the quiet, soft spoken one, and um, Jafar was supposed to be this like boisterous, loud, evil, angry character. And they're like, you know what? His Flip evil him. is kind of diminish when he's just like yelling at everybody. So let's, yeah, let's swap it and let it be more. Because people who are the best evil people are quiet. You know, yeah, deliberate calculating. And yeah. I'm glad they made that decision because Gosh, it, it's it w- definitely what makes him so sinister. Yeah, it would have been really lame to have it be the parrot be the main antagonist. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't, don't think it was that he was going to be the main no, antagonist. No, no, I know. It'd be the quiet one, but then you'd realize he's the smart one, and then you'd realize, okay, like this guy's just big, dumb, and stupid, and actually the parrot's manipulating him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, well. Yeah. If they went that route, it also would clash with the bombastic nature of Genie and Robin mm-hmm. Williams. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all right, so Aladdin is captured by um, Jafar and his mm-hmm. his cronies, or I should just say the palace guard. Um, Razul, voiced by Jim Cummings, another yep. Disney popular. Hey. Yeah. What a roundabout way of doing this, though. This is like one thing where I was like, Jafar, you probably could have had it easier if you just posed as the old man. Yeah, I don't even think you need to prison imprison Aladdin. Just be like, hey Aladdin, you wanna you wanna be up there in that temple or in that palace? I got I got this place. I got this lamp you can go get and that'll, well, that'll help you out. Or this thing. A uh, plot point that kind of gets overlooked too is like why did they arrest Aladdin? It wasn't because they were looking for Jean or for J- Jasmine. It was yeah. because he, you know, took the uh you know ring from the Sultan and used it to scry Aladdin as the true diamond of the rough, which I think in the original story, that ring was actually the first um, genie. Yeah. Um, that was oh, less in power to the lamp genie. Um, so they actually used the genie to get the the second lamp. Oh. But that's kind of a callback okay. to the original, where you still have this kind of magical ring aspect. Right. So there's a there in this movie. Is there actually like a genie hiding inside that ring? I don't think so. I think it's no, probably just a reference. Sit, yeah, it's just talk yeah. about itty bitty living space, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. even smaller. Uh, yeah, so he's the. They then make their way to the the cave of wonders. That's what it's called, right? You know, the yes. cave of wonder. Aladdin and Abu break in, and uh, they come across the magic carpet. Magic carpet. Yep. Uh, I think this was ha- partial. Some scenes were CGI, and some mm. were not. Am I? mistaken like the magic carpet it looked like a blend at times like at times yeah, it looked they, like they, yeah. mapped, yeah. they mapped the color and texture on you know basically a rectangle so but yeah. they you know had to have him mime um and give him like real character to a rug i mean that that was an accomplishment in of itself it did a real good job carpet it, was my favorite character from this movie honestly <laughs> like yeah. as a kid, i always he wanted was magic my carpet. favorite yep. oh, yeah definitely. <laughs> Just because i actually this. i actually like i thought the carpet brought out Abu more as a character too, oh, yeah. where it was just like I liked them kind of just fight. Not, they weren't. The they never fought over each other, but they, there was just this like this clash. almost sibling yeah. rivalry. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like it, bickering. It almost bit. felt like carpet was um, uh, the genie's sort of animal familiar. You know, everyone has their animals, and the yeah. carpet just pairs with the genie. Yeah, there you go. But didn't um, I? I thought I heard from what you were listening to, David. Didn't they? model a lot of carpets movements after things like buster keaton mm-hmm. and charlie chaplin yep, sure did yeah the, so silent performers basically yeah. and yeah. that really really works because you oh i love i love when he's like told to go away and he just like hunches over and then just <laughs> kind of like shuffles <laughs> off yes. uh, all, all of a his lot of, movements a lot of personality so good there. yeah the body language is excellent uh, so Aladdin makes his way up to get the the lamp, and of course the uh, Abu is tempted by the treasure, picks up the the uh, red ruby, and triggers the closing of the the mouth of Cave of Wonders and the big old lava spew and our roller coaster ride that looks terrible. Looks like <laughs> um, a, the original Doom on PC or like that oh, yeah. maze screensaver. Yeah, it does. This I think. This movie, ninety nine percent of it looks excellent, and then there's this one scene, like 
and I'm not even talking about the whole roller coaster scene. Like some of it looks great. But then there's this one scene where they're heading Blue towards this wall. wall and then they go yeah. down and I'm like, oh boy, that was bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember noticing that even early on, but you know, mm-hmm. yeah. it is what it is. I it's, just remember mm. this level on the Super Nintendo game was terribly difficult to get past. Yeah, <laughs> it, it had to be something where it was like a last minute, like, oh, we, we, we just got to release this movie, we, but we need this scene. We just got to put it in there to just add some something more to this scene that's missing and they were like all right throw it together we're good ship it yeah. well this it was before they had the deep canvas technology and 3d mapping on something that to that scale i just i don't think they could do it just yet you know something that yeah. large yeah uh but still a fun little action sequence him making his way out of the, the cave of wonders i still like it overall um yeah just jumping across the uh you know the little bursting rocks that yeah uh, those I'll, were so satisfying to me. Yeah, there's so many time. style choices that, you know, define, I mean, even the contours of the rocks and the walls and all the glittering yep. gems and the Cave of Wonders itself. I mean, it's got character itself. It's, mm-hmm. I don't know. It is a Cave it, of Wonders yeah. indeed. And then the old man reveals himself to be Jafar as uh, Aladdin hands him the lamp. Then he uh, tries to hand him a knife. It takes yep. out this really this gnarly really dagger. Good. <laughs> that doesn't work out. Uh, Aladdin still gets pushed off and um, is saved at last minute by the carpet. Um, Jafar is shir- searching his pocket for the lamp he thinks he has. He does not. It's still uh, Aladdin still man- managed to take it with him That's down good. into Abu. the uh, Abu. Uh, yeah, Abu. It. Yeah, yeah. So now he's he's in the cave of wonders. The mouth is closed up, and uh, Jafar is left out in the open, uh, screaming to the skies. Uh, where are we at? Is this where we left off? That's well. Did we were we introduced to Aladdin uh, rubs one out real quick? Oh gosh, thanks. Yeah, we he gets out of the cave of wonders, and that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we will pick hey, up. Is one wish we... to unhear what you just said. <laughs> yeah, my, my first wish is to erase everything that Noah just said. What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> I, don't I don't know. Who knows? I don't know what you're um, talking about, Reese. Uh, hey, kids, take off your clothes. <laughs> oh what? <laughs> I'm going to have fun editing this episode. No, that's something that there's all these, these conspiracy theories with Disney movies, how they slip in these like, you know, kind yeah. of sexual innuendo kind of things. And, and they this, 100% do it. In this I don't one. remember that one though. Which one was so, that one in? That's that where was literally. When? Yeah. No, here Aladdin leans towards the camera and as an aside kind of sounds like he whispers, Hey kids, take off your clothes. Oh, I didn't even know. Like, I've seen all the ones with the, the uh, like, in Little Mermaid where the priest looks like he has a, an erection, and I, the, the sex yeah. in Lion King. The phallic uh, castle the, of Little the Mermaid. The phallic castle in Little Mermaid. I, I never knew there was one in Aladdin. But Yeah, cool. and then the other one in Aladdin is, like, there's that, you know, hopping across the bursting rocks in the lava where Abu and his monkey screechy voice, it's, it sounds very close to, sounds like he says, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, and when you listen you for Disney that, it makes it so much more fun. People. It's for a little, little something for the adults. Anyway, so that's a sidetrack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we will magic. pick. So technically, this is when we are introduced to our genie, but we will pick up with that on the other side. We'll kind of once we get through the next part of the story, then mm-hmm. we'll, we'll remind me to open with obviously the genie. So uh, oh. Noah, do you want to continue that story there? Sure. The genie, upon being freed from the lamp, grants Aladdin three wishes. Aladdin tricks him into freeing them from the cave without using a wish, and uses his first wish to become a prince, in order to flirt with the princess. But he has a rival in the form of Jafar, who plots to become sultan by marrying Jasmine. Aladdin, now calling himself Prince Ali Ababwa, arrives in town, making a grand entrance. After some wooing, he and Jasmine ride the magic carpet all night long. (laughs) <laughs> Jafar, in a jealous rage, has Aladdin thrown into the sea, where Aladdin is forced to make his second wish. He returns and exposes Jafar's evil plot. Jafar flees, but not before discovering Aladdin's identity. Worried that he will lose Jasmine if the truth is revealed, Aladdin breaks his promise to free the genie, but the lamp is stolen and Jafar becomes the new master. He uses his first two wishes to become the sultan and the most powerful sorcerer in the world. He then exposes Aladdin's identity, exiling him to a frozen wasteland. They escape, and him and Jasmine try and fail to retrieve the lamp. Aladdin, with his Jedi mind tricks, convinces Jafar to become a genie. 
as the genies are all-powerful. This ends up binding him to a lamp. With everything back to normal, the genie tells Aladdin to use his last wish to regain his royal title, so he can stay with Jasmine. Aladdin refuses, instead deciding that he will keep his promise and free the genie. The Sultan, upon seeing Aladdin's nobility, allows Aladdin and Jasmine to marry. They all bid the genie farewell as they begin their new life. Thus ends Aladdin. Yeah, there's a lot of there is a lot of story. Yes, that. that's what I'm saying. This whole thing is chock full of different developments that you can't not mention in the plot. Yeah, but they're all told. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, like it's all rattled off. Yeah, rapidly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the fact that they made it, it roll so smoothly in this is actually amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is, of course, a Robin Williams miniseries, so it'd be foolish of us not mm -hmm. to devote a significant amount of time to talking about Robin Williams as the genie. So he is revealed in the Cave of Wonders, uh, and this, for me, as much as the movie is good up until this point, like, I think the movie becomes something completely different. Like, it's almost inspired by its... So, like, they, they found, found a new... I don't know, inspiration and decided to just really go for it mm. once uh, Robin Williams is there. I feel like it. It the animators had the most fun. Maybe this was the most grueling part for them because Robin Williams is such a hard guy to, you know, animate for because he's constantly doing unexpected stuff. But it, it, it seemed like the animators were like challenge accepted and they went above yeah. and beyond oh, uh, yeah. to try and meet. F funny you bring you know, that up. Yeah, what? Which, well, there's a whole lot to be said here and I don't know how much David has because this is his... His oh, man. Uh, I, series around Robin Williams. Hey, it, this is also your movie, I feel like. This is, um, I mean, it's big for both of us, but it seems like you had a big, you know, childhood with this movie. Um, all right. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I'll defer to you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off and we'll riff off each other. How about that? So sure. with Robin Williams in this, I, I they basically hired him because he's so good at improv and... I, he actually didn't do that many recordings. I believe they only had, what, four four sessions of recordings where he just went for hours, I think four mm -hmm. hours at a time, and, and just riffed uh, every single scene, like 20 takes per, um, you know, section. In true Robin Williams fashion. Yeah, and then they, they kind of, I think uh, the directors went through and kind of just picked the funniest ones and, and rolled with them and just told the animators to, to go off of that. Or the most appropriate ones. <laughs> he did right. have some inappropriate things. Yeah. Oh, you, there, is there an NC-17 cut of Aladdin? Yes. Oh, yeah. Like, like there was for Mrs. Doubtfire? <laughs> but even further than that, they actually... I mean, the genie is the epitome of Robin Williams, in my opinion. And it mm -hmm. is for a lot of people. It's definitely up there. Mm. Um, but that's well, that, for that very good reason. That makes sense when he passed away. Like, one of the main images going around is him, yeah. him as the genie hugging uh, uh, Aladdin. And that's why it was so controversial, you know, and even any discussion of when the live action was coming up, the first thing is who's going to play Genie? You know, yeah. Robin, or, um, uh, we have, gosh. Will Smith. Thank you. Will Smith. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, getting the part there and, you know, got some good and bad, but um, there's, <laughs> who should replace Robin Williams? Can anyone replace Robin Williams? The answer to that question is no, because this movie was basically revolving around Robin Williams. They courted mm -hmm. him. They designed the character of the genie and a lot of the spirit of this movie on Robin Williams' stand-up. They saw yeah. him. Um, and, you know, we talked a little about Eis um, Eisner and, and Katzenberg um, during our Black Horse animation uh, mm -hmm. spiel. But basically, this was kind of a... Katzenberg a drama thing with Robin Williams in the end, but they saw Robin Williams acting. He was actually signed to do Fern Gully, yeah. which also kind of courted him to be this ca kind of character. He's the bat in Fern Gully, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But he really liked that because it had this environmental message. They actually convinced Robin Williams to take this part by animating. They had their lead animator Goldstein, um, Larry Goldstein. Is that correct? Um, sorry so. if I got that wrong. They drew, they took one of his skits and drew, animated the genie, you know, doing that to his skit and they, they shipped it to him and he was sold based on that. So wow. Aladdin, you know, is all about the genie and spirit and heart 
um, and is so memorable because of the genie, and the genie is so memorable because of Robin Williams. And this isn't to diminish Robin Williams' talent, but it was literally tailored to Robin Williams, to the fact that if they didn't get him to sign on, they didn't know what they were going to do. Right. They had a lot of options, I believe, for uh, backups. And when I yeah. heard what those options were, I was like, that's a that's a very different movie. Yeah, um, Eddie Murphy you, and you I think some others. Um, yeah, Eddie Murphy was one. And, you know, back in the day, I forget. You know, this is what. And then you know, he got Mushu. Early. Right. And so that this actually kind of kicked off. I think we had, you know, Oliver and Company had um, Billy Joel in that. But this really kind of kicked off the trend of having a celebrity comic in a key character right. role in Disney animation. And unfortunately, that kind of turned into, you know, Katzenberg kind of took that into a commercial thing. Um, and that really kind of spiraled out and, you know, across all animation, not just Disney Studios. But mm. here, at least, it was had the heart of it. It wasn't a pure cash grab. It actually brought the heart uh, because of Robin Williams. Oh yeah, this has the, the 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 right balance of that. Like the, the yeah. fact that you have a big star in your animated movie, it doesn't feel like it's just to get make a buck. Right. It it feels appropriate. Whereas, uh, yeah, you you bring up DreamWorks. We're literally, and I like some DreamWorks movies. We've all talked about them, but. Literally, the whole first five people in the cast are all huge, like A-list stars, and I'm like, do, yeah. do we need that? No. To the point where budgets just balloon because you literally have this trailer and like ten names pop up that are all celebrities. You don't even know what the story's about because yeah. they're just like, oh, hey, you know, get butts and seats, you know, just to see these celebrities. Yeah, the Boss but, Baby, voiced by Alec Baldwin. Uh, yeah. I feel like the new Mario Kano movie whatever. coming up. I feel the same way about that new Mario movie. Oh, Illumination is almost even worse than DreamWorks yeah. about uh, it. Ugh. But um, yeah, so Robin Williams had a spat with Disney after this because he literally in his contract said, I don't want my talent being used for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. So a quarter of their, uh, I think, advertising revenue or advertising airtime, you know, couldn't be using the genie or his voice, um, which, you know, telling that to Disney is kind of a, a long shot, but uh, <laughs> because he really wanted it to be about the heart about of the character of the movie, and he didn't want it to eat into, um, you know, attention for some of the others' movies. But you know, Disney kind of reneged on that eventually, and yep. so uh, Robin Williams refused to work with Disney ever again. So that's why the direct to uh, VHS sequel, Return of Jafar. Um, Genie was not voiced by Robin Williams, but rather by Homer Simpson. Uh, forgive me, I forget his voice. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, in the and second then one. they kind of made up a little bit by the, the third. So Robin Williams returned for the third. But, but it goes to show that... It's just direct to DVD. Yeah, but it's... I mean, they're not bad. I mean, Return of Jafar has its, you know, cons for sure. But um, the King of Thieves is still got some goodness to it because Robin Williams is in it. But, well, they you know, we're talking about... both of them. Yeah, and we're we're talking about Robin Williams as you know our our theme here, and that's interesting that he brings this heart and he wants this message that's kind of got you know he he throws in those you know adult jokes and stuff, but at the at the same time he wants this to have kind of a wholesome aspect of it for kids and and stuff like that that's not just all about money, right? Um, and I think that shines through in the character of the genie and in the spirit mm -hmm. of this movie how genie you know has his relationship with Aladdin and everyone and how do they grow together and friends and you know the end where you know he's freed and that genuineness um shines through and i think that's why this movie is so memorable and this character is so memorable you so know, yeah if that's you enough think about of my it, monologue <laughs> if, you, if you think about something like the genie something that is literally larger than life powerful uh, you need a an actor who can carry that energy that is larger than life and, I mean, there are very few comics that could do it like Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may have had to take some uh, performance-enhancing uh, drugs to, to get there, but he is, like, by and large, one of the greatest comics, I think, of all time. Mm. Well, and that energy, the, the color. I mean, the best way to is colorful. I mean, it's so vibrant. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Reese had, had this question of ranking the, the numbers in the soundtrack. Friend Like Me is number one for me. This scene where Jeannie basically explains how to, you know, who he is, how he can help Aladdin and the wishes, the whole thing. That, you know, fun number. 
I do think it is so the best musical often, number in the movie as well. I think I yeah, agree with you there. It's so often imitated. Oh yeah. Just I mean it, it's and it, it's this pivotal piece of this movie. Yep. Uh, yeah, and as I said, it, new life is kind of injected into this movie. It was already really doing okay. Like I didn't have any problems with it at, up until this point, but this is where it evolved from a. And I the, obviously this movie's burned into my brain, but for me as a, a trying to watch this objectively, it evolved from a standard good Disney movie to like the classic status that it deserves mm-hmm. right. at this point. Once Robin Williams comes in on the, on the scene, you're like, oh yeah. oh yeah, this is why this is a classic. Yeah. Like it, it, you're kind of like, did y'all go through the same like kind of thought process throughout this where you're like, oh yeah, this is real good, this is the classic, and then it just finds the you, it, it found this new energy. It's, it's like yeah. it's like timeless aspect. It literally it transcends just the the time it was made. But I feel like he, he, it's like he's this wave that lift, lifts all the ships in yeah, the ocean. Right. Where it's like. It ma- he makes Aladdin better. He makes Jasmine better. He makes all of them mm. better when he enters. Like they yeah. they step up oh, as yeah. well. It's, like it's like it's as if when there there are movie experiences I have where when I'm watching a new film, you're there's always kind of this um, dread, especially when it's a greatly anticipated film where you're not sure if it's going to live up to mm. the hype. And but then there will be this moment where there's that shift where you realize oh. I'm in good hands. Like yeah. it, you just get this pick me up during yes. the movie where you're like, oh, okay, this won't go wrong. I know it won't go yeah. wrong. The movie's and playing I think me that's, like it's playing me like a fiddle. Yeah, now, I whereas... think that's <laughs> what Genie does for the rest of the yes. film too. Creates... And but at the same time, he doesn't completely steal the story, no. which is very good. He like, adds to it. Yeah, yeah. he's what? the backbone for true dynamic. Um, yeah, you know the tension. Even when he and um, Aladdin are, you know, feuding, have the spat, like you generally feel bad because yeah. you know, mm-hmm. one, not only that, you know, you have this foreboding that something bad's going to happen, but you don't want to see these two people fighting because you mm-hmm. want them to truly, you know, get along mm-hmm. and, and care about each other. And then when, you know, Genie is quote unquote owned by Jafar or the lamp is, you know, in, in Jafar's possession that terror like just truly highlights the evil of Jafar and right. because it's so, you know, c- conflicted with the dynamic goodness of the genie. Mm. Right. And yeah. you, you find yourself as an audience member wanting to protect genie. Like he has this kind of innocence about him where you're like, no, don't use him for bad deeds, you know, kind of a yeah. thing where yeah. you want him to be protected. Mm hmm. Uh, so Genie gives him the whole spiel on his wishes. He's got three. Uh, Aladdin kind of like convinces him to, you know, get him out of the cave without technically making a wish. Love it. Kind uh, of Tom Sawyer moment. Yeah. But <laughs> um, he does it so in a get- way that's not like he doesn't seem like you know bad or tr- like tricks. No, it didn't seem malicious. Like no. manipulative. Like it's kind of him being just street smart. That's how he always gets by. Is yeah, you know, cheeky. Kind it's, of clicking up and catching up with, with the keeping with the character. Uh, yeah, and the, yeah, in the live action, they like, really ruined it. Like he literally, like he's working with a boo to kind of deliberately trick him in a, oh, a almost yeah. a malicious way, and mm-hmm. that kind of was off putting for me. Here, it was just kind of a natural part of how he rolls with the punches. Yeah, he's right. just street smart, and he's you know he's getting mm. the most well, he can out of something without it, it, without trying to inflict pain or manipulate someone else well and it was also a little unfair because it's like you get this genie with three wishes but you know you're stuck at the bottom of a cave so it's like well that's one thing wasted right there you have to use one wish to get out of here mm-hmm. so at the very least it, it almost like evens the score for him well he pretty much only gets one wish mm-hmm. this whole movie yeah <laughs> yeah like he, the the other two circumstances were forced upon him by unnatural means right well one wish was he releases the genie the other one was forced on him because he was dying that's what i'm saying yeah Yeah. Yeah. i think also for this moment you can argue that aladdin in at this point in the story is still kind of a flawed character like he's at a point where he he believes that oh yeah i have to be street smart i have to be kind of conniving to get by and then once he does use a wish to kind of you know, see the high life for a moment. That's when he starts feeling this conflict of, hey, maybe I should be more honest, you know? And uh, he, you can see him start to regret the fact that he's lying 
when it, he's not really doing anything incredibly evil, but he starts to realize that maybe getting things in a dishonest way isn't yeah. where I want to be, not who I want to yeah. be. He says yeah. he's not a street rat, but then he kind of does act like a street right. rat. He realizes that he's not confident in his own inner goodness and power of himself to be good and overcome because he kind of relies on these old fallbacks. Right. Um, yeah. But then he kind of realizes that, you know, be, by becoming a, a prince in appearance, he relies, that's his street rat is still being a, a prince. But then yeah. as he goes through that in his relationship with Jeannie, Jeannie shows him that, you know, he can be a prince royally. Yeah. In, in, from, in, from within. Speaking and even, of, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that even early on, he establishes or understands the fact that Jeannie is trapped in his position, but that Aladdin is perfectly capable of wishing for his freedom at that point, but he doesn't. Yeah. So it's it's like he he sympathizes with Genie, but he still doesn't immediately release him because mm-hmm. he wants to use that power, you know? So it's, when you think about it that way, it's interesting seeing Aladdin's story arc where it's it's kind of subtly done, but you definitely see that change in him yeah so mm-hmm. speaking of becoming a prince his first wish uh prince ali is another one of my favorite songs mm-hmm. yep. yes uh, <laughs> it's a very good one uh talk about a song that just keeps upping itself and just getting bigger and more bombastic and then finally when they ramp up and then slow it down again for maximum effectiveness it's right. uh it's beautiful it's a good song and yeah. lots of colors lots of fun this leads into um him trying to impress Jasmine, him making a bunch of idiotic decisions, uh, but it's more because he's insecure about himself. So you right. under, you understand why he's making those decisions. He feels like he can never be accepted by someone like Jasmine, so he feels forced to be a prince. And this is that kind of subtle, those kind of little character subtleties that we're talking mm-hmm. about. It's written large because it's an animated movie, but uh, I think it's still you know effective and um, it's so. There's times though when you just like, hey, Jasmine's trying to give you an out here. She doesn't care. Yeah, and, but he's just like, I am a prince. Yeah, and then you like, just do a face palm. Like, yeah, I, guess, like, <laughs> I just, I just love how where she's like, I don't know, you look really familiar. No, and, but you, even, even when magic carpets kind of like, go on, on tell her. <laughs> well, I love this is another great like Robin Williams stuff when he's the the buzzing bee, <laughs> bee and and, and, and health. Yeah, he, <laughs> no, he gives it. He's giving him all these buzzwords to say, and he takes the one that and, and that's not good, and then the, the, the genie's like, punctual. "Sorry, <laughs> punctual." I mean, I mean punctual's not bad. No, it's it's like he suddenly went into buzzwords for a resume or something, you know. <laughs> but I love that. I love that moment where the the genie feels slightly guilty, just says, "Sorry," real quick, Sorry. and he's like, beautiful, and he's like, "Good recovery." Uh, <laughs> But yeah, subtle moments, of, not subtle, but moments of comedy like that, I, mm-hmm. I, I just love and uh, only Robin Williams can do. Um, but this quickly leads up into the whole new world scene. Uh, Ali or Prince Ali or Al- Aladdin starts to find his mojo a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, becomes more comfortable in his princely skin. And uh, we have our whole, you know, a whole new world. Is this your least favorite song, Arena? Yes. Okay. And I, I think, and it might just be because every girl I ever knew wanted to sing this song all the time. Excuse and, me. I'm a guy. And you, David. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> not to mention, anytime there's a karaoke night, which I try. rarely happens, David's like, sing a whole new I world try. with I me. I try. And I keep trying to tell him my vocal range is not that That's, high. <laughs> I, except for it is. She just I will doesn't take this it. movie 10 million times over Let It Go. It, okay. I, the thing is, Let It Go is really annoying because I hear it all the time, but it's it's still a decent song. I, I don't mind it. I just find this one kind of, I don't know. I guess it's just the fact that I what, heard it too much. What I will say about it is it is a bit jarring. Mm-hmm. From a, like, we were here at this awkward moment, and now suddenly we're here. Like, it's like a sudden, like, oh, we are, we're in love pretty much immediately. Yeah, they I, uh, kiss. I feel at, like but well, she she kind of subtly notices or yeah. f- believes that he is Aladdin, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that she's 
smarter than that. And so she's kind of playing along in a way, well, but also not playing along. It's like that. Uh, the The thing he says is that, well, sometimes I pretend to be a commoner and do that. So... <laughs> <laughs> such a stupid lie it's a it's a really stupid lie however that is like that's where it you yeah, know yeah she's all like it's hey like, all right I, whatever. I, I get you well so, I, I actually do keep in mind there was a law where a princess could not marry anyone yeah. other than a prince right yeah, right exactly so he's like, well, that and you know the culture of you know arranged marriages and stuff like that yeah um but you know and also this kind of speaks to i mean young love they're both relatively young um, right 16 and 18 pretty much but um yeah and and but it, it's true love i guess in the, a disney sense where she wants to marry for love and she sees you know the the question that sparks her interest is do you tr- trust me which is an intimate connection instead of the right. showy you know riding on the elephant kind of thing um and throwing money around like she doesn't want that so you know, she really wants this you know, deeper person. And you have the symbolism of the apple and the lily because right. the apple harkens back to his, you know, early street rat nature. Um, and she, that's kind of a clue that tips her off too. But, and that the lily is kind of the show, you know, white, I guess, purity kind of thing. But yeah, and you, you said it was jarring. I think, you know, to your point, it's a duet and there's a power in duets. And this is one of the most iconic duets that has that yeah. kind of. And a ballad of all yeah. time, I would say. Yeah, it, it, it's a great number, and I think the fact that it is overplayed just kind of, I mean, it's like Journey. Like, Journey yeah. has great songs, but, you know, everyone and their mom sings it left and right, so then it's like, okay, I don't really want to hear this for the umpteenth time. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Actually, I like the song. I, I don't have too many issues with yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's great, and, you know, it is jarring because I think someone did the math, and they're going around the world, and carpet's basically going 1,100 kilometers an hour. <laughs> it, it, or it eleven hundred kilometers a second, actually. But they're which, sitting uh, on it. Yeah, because they go to see the Chinese New Year, and so they break the sound barrier. So they're <laughs> hey, they're really he making that magic. Is showing her a figurative world. It's actually just like a, one of those. Uh, someone's like pedaling, and it's just like a, a screen <laughs> going around them. Yes. They're not there actually is, going anywhere at all. It is. It's. It's very beautiful. I mean, I mean the clouds, the sky, and you know, skimming on the surface of the water that goes along with it. I mean, it's. Right. It's all part of that colorful dynamic. Do y'all buy into this being like a, a sex metaphor, this whole song? Because that's been like the internet <laughs> mm-hmm. culture lately around this thing where it's like, let me show you a whole new world. Like, I wouldn't know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but some lines are very suspicious. Alan Menken, g- get to us on that one. Yeah, uh, I don't know. The thing is, this probably wasn't intentional. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm gonna take it that way. Look, there's a lot of things that under. could be misconstrued. <laughs> but I. I would think that if it weren't intentional, they probably should have noticed. No, I mean you're just. <laughs> it's free-willing, 92. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. There's there's so many things that can you know have double meaning, especially with yep. relationship love kind of things. That's like, okay, you can try to read however much you want to anything and, and twist it, whatever. I mean, context is the key here. You know mm-hmm. what? What is mm-hmm. it really important? I don't know. I no. think it's people just trying to. It's not create buzz about something. Yeah, sensationalized. I just thought I'd toss that aside <laughs> real quick. I will also toss say it in there with this song. It it won a Grammy Award and an Academy Award for Best Original Song, and I think it says on here that it was the first and only Disney song so far to ever win in that category. So none of the Little Mermaid songs or Beauty and the Beast won. Nope. Beauty and Beast had to have won something. Uh, Did they I'm have duets? Reading- the Wikipedia, it just says... Oh, wait, was Beauty and the Beast duet. after this? Uh, they, no, Beauty, no, no, I no. think Beauty and the Beast came a year before, I believe. Right. That's stupid. Like How Beauty, are the duet? <sighs> Beauty and the Beast, the whole, the whole ball scene, like the... Uh, the oh my gosh, it might be a different I think award. That was nominated, I think. Either the You're song or the You're talking about Tale as Old as Time? Yeah, Tale as Old as Time. Like, that's a... Ugh. Classic. <laughs> ugh. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, moving on with the plot. Uh, Sultan... Why do I keep calling him Sultan? Uh, Jafar. Jafar. Uh, <laughs> he basically acts He's like a sultan. He wants bit. to be the Sultan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jafar is up to no good yet again. Basically, after the whole flight of fancy between Jasmine and Aladdin, uh, Jafar kind of ends, ends Aladdin's night of fun, has him tossed in the river by all the guards, 
honestly, like, man, Jafar is a, a t- he's attempted murder yeah. multiple times. Yeah, now. no, he's a, a, there's actual stakes in this movie. Like, yeah. uh, uh, I, I want to clarify something real quick. Uh-huh. Um, so Beauty and the Beast did win the same award for best original score, or uh, best original song for the Academy Award, but um, it didn't win the Grammy, which is... Well, Grammys have always sucked in yes, way, it's so. a very, which is very different. But I wanted to clarify this. There's going to be someone listening like, um, actually, Beauty and the Beast did win an Academy Award. Yeah. And I'm going to go, I know. So, <laughs> I know. Go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I knew it had to have won something. Beauty and the Beast. Like, yes. It, yeah. I think Beauty and the Beast was the first to win the Academy Award for an animated movie, but Aladdin yeah. was the only one to get the you know other one. Anyway, actually, actually tense scene, though, here with uh, Aladdin nearly drowning. Uh, mm-hmm. it's nice seeing the genie, you know, feel something, but he's like, come on, buddy. He's like really pulling for him. And he's like, okay, that's good enough. I'll save you. Like kind of forces him to like mm-hmm. nod his head. It, or, really, <laughs> it really makes the guards to me seem more malicious than I ever intended yeah. or ever assumed. Yeah. Like uh, they're always chasing him, but they're like happy to murder him. They're like, ha, 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 all right, toss yep. him in the water. Uh, well, those are, you can assume Jafar's personal lackeys. Yeah, Jafar loyalists, I bet. Yeah. J- Jafar you made them run on hot coals. <laughs> <laughs> Jafar gets a hold of the lamp, and the genie is forced. That's what happens next, pretty much, right? Yeah, the genie is forced to grant him three wish- wishes. And, uh, of course, Jafar is pretty quick about what he wants. He's like, I want to be the most powerful thing, uh, dude in the world. Sorcerer. Yeah, sorcerer in the world, yada, yada, yada. Then um, Aladdin and is uh, all of his people, the, ma- the magic carpet, Abu, and uh, uh, they are, are on a mission now to retrieve the lamp and save uh, Jasmine, who has been captured by... Uh, why do I always forget his? It's Jafar. Jafar. I know it's Jafar, <laughs> but like I always, <laughs> he- I always he- hey, he's the Sultan now. I know. I always hesitate. Like it's a hard name to remember. I'm like, no, it's Jafar. Literally one of the top three Disney villains. So just remember it, you idiot. Like that's what I need to tell mm. my tell myself. Uh, but yeah, uh, Jasmine's in peril. She's uh, the sand is, you know, she's in a huge hourglass and the sand is piling up and she's like nearly about to. Uh, no wait, I got those two mixed up. First, she is. Uh, she seduces Jafar. Yeah, Jafar puts her in, you know, some, you know, scantily. Yeah, it's yeah, scanty weird. Scanty clothing That's for some reason. It's about the same amount of coverage, just red. Yeah. yeah. It's all the same. But, but she's he's like, like dolled up. red. Yeah, she's more like dolled up. She looks a little edgy. Because red is hot. Yeah. <laughs> hey, she's got a you also skip, <laughs> you, you skip the part where um, Jafar like skyrockets Aladdin to like Siberia. And that's he, right that's right he makes his way back on the carpet which i i just love when he comes back it's like how many times do i have to kill you <laughs> like he does try to murder him at least I know, three times like, in this movie three to four Sleep times at, uh, never mind words i give this up. whole crescendo of jafar's rise and, and his power trip is like li- it's literally one of the most successful portrayals of a, a villain's you know villainy in my opinion, yeah. especially in animation. And I think that's, and I, I write about this in the article or my review of the live action is a point they really missed with that Jafar. Mm-hmm. Just the, the scale of Jafar's power and the crescendo of each step and how he truly like goes into it in such, I mean, it is, it is evil. Yeah. The yeah. movie, the movie, the live action one whiffs so oh, hard on Jafar where it's like, worst part of that he, he becomes like a mm. cloud or something. Like, I'm like, no, what, what made you think like an evil cloud was more exciting or a bat, or whatever it is. Like, it's something weird. Like, there's a red cloud, and there's, like, a big bat or something. What made no, them think Iago that was more exciting? this giant monster bird. Yeah, something like that. What made them think that was cooler than a big, freaking red genie who is just insanely, like, like kaiju size? Yep. Causing destruction, like I, I, massive six pack. <laughs> yeah, it's so much cooler. Like they, they mm. obviously had the budget to do a, a CGI extravaganza at the end. Why didn't you put it towards something cooler uh, and more? I don't know, imposing. And all uh, the swords and the red, you know, wash of everything, and him literally spitting fire in a circle around him. There's like this actual element of danger. Right. Yeah. And then the cobra. I mean, it just it's the, the it's animation. So good really shined in this finale too like just seeing you know the original G- or uh, Robin Williams genie get big and, and kind of be forced to do almost yeah. evil like it's like the white eyes the yeah. shooting the light no it's like it's scary it is yeah mm. uh, no it's it's really well done it just also 
the the really cool thing about his uh character too is that it's written from that standpoint of you know the the contemplative careful type of villain but at this point he thinks he's won and that's why he's letting loose he yeah. thinks there's no chance at this point now finally because he has all of the power that he can lose it and so he just goes a little unhinged and with that overconfidence uh aladdin's able to trick him yes which is exactly how people get tricked is through overconfidence oh, while yeah. they're on a power trip exactly yeah, he wasn't even thinking about what it means to be a genie he was yeah. like oh a genie's the most powerful thing yeah obviously i want to be that he totally like, yeah. misutilized it though. brain brains went out the window <laughs> well, <he's literally laughs> like the, he's power drunk i mean aladdin yeah. goes to him he's like oh i'll show you how serpent white snake like i can be and turns into this giant cobra and it's it's like just the black it's so like there's so yeah. much malice embedded in him metal yeah. There, yeah, yeah, there's like a there there's like a huge exploit here too where you could probably just give the you know give a condition to a number of people and have them line up and take the genie's power and do like two wishes, not complete it, so whatever, and then yeah. pass it along and just get like infinite wishes. Actually, yeah, there's I mean, I've I've thought about the loopholes here. But <laughs> maybe that should be a Patreon thing. Like we all go. What's our what, think about what our three wishes are? If you want to hear what Ooh. each of our three oh, wishes are, that's a good idea. That's a Patreon episode. Maybe we'll we'll talk about Man. it during our rewards as well. Well, yeah. rewards. also by the way, the original story. He, yeah, I think there are infinite wishes. Correct. Uh, I believe that there are the three wishes was actually created by Disney for this. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. The original story it, is infinite wishes. It goes back to you know the kind of power limit, so to speak, of the genie. Of the Jin, um, I guess would be the more actual word. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, kind of earlier, you have the the, the Jin of the the ring, which kind of can only do certain things, and then the lamp is why everyone's or you know Jafar or the sor- sorcerer is seeking that because it's almost this limitless power where you yeah. can actually mm-hmm. accomplish these you know worldwide worldwide domination kind of goals. Yeah. Well, what I love about this ending too is the fact that to defeat Jafar in this moment, he, Aladdin had to rely on the strengths that he built up himself, something that he always had, yes. which was oh, using yeah. his good cunning and using point. his streetwise. Yeah. Very good and, point. Yep. And I, I think you know he could even in that moment at the end, even the even um, Robin Williams genie, he couldn't discern the the trick yep. that that Aladdin was setting up, mm-hmm. uh, which. You know, sells it even more. Actually, I think I remember as a kid watching it the first time, thinking like, "Aladdin, that's a very, very bad idea." Yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> and I just it, it's set up so so well because you know you don't think about the fact that he's going to be imprisoned. You know, he actually moment. learned something today. And yep. You know, that's yeah, I'm glad you brought this up, and I'm on oddly enough the one comparing it to the live action the most. But that's something that the live action screwed up as well. In the live action, it's Genie's idea, and he tries to get you know. Aladdin's eye and pointing to his cuffs and say, "Hey, wish him to be a genie so he's trapped like me," instead of it being Aladdin's idea. Yeah, which you know ruins the whole point of him actually learning something about his character. Yeah. Well, the live action seemed to really focus even more on Will Smith almost than this movie focused on Robin Williams, which is a very odd choice. Um, but not to say Will Smith is bad, obviously. I mean, no, well, we're not he, talking about that. But he's the only one that that works for it. But the the point of everything is wrong. Like yeah, everything, the, the it's four, everything's wrong. Everything's done wrong, but he's the only thing that kind of works. Yeah, he's redeemable for sure. Like, but it just, they set up the story very interestingly around him. Maybe we'll cover that one another we day. We might, we might. Mm. Yeah. If we're not covering it now though. But until like, then, read read uh, AJ's score on screenpunk.net. I think there's a very interesting miniseries we could do on like all the Disney live action remakes because almost every one of them has either been greenlit for a sequel or wanted a sequel. Uh, it's a that's a that's a rabbit hole, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so Alice in Wonderland two? There was one. There was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was Alice uh, through the looking glass rabbit hole joke. Oh yeah, yeah. I got you. I, fo- I followed you there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you followed um, him down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yep. All right, so Jafar is defeated. We obviously discussed that. Uh, now we get our, our happy ending. The Sultan is like, you know what? Screw the rules. Uh, I like this guy. This guy, Aladdin's proven himself. Uh, you, you can be with my daughter. Uh, we're, we're just going to scratch that rule. And, oh, wait, uh, I make the our... rules. 
it, it was like, if it was that easy, why didn't you do it to begin with? <laughs> Because uh, uh, because Jafar, that's why. Yeah, also Aladdin goes to the genie and says, uh, you're free. I like this moment because the genie is like fully happy to give Aladdin another wish that he wants. Mm -hmm. And then he mishears him at first and is like, oh, oh, you actually wished for that. You you wished my freedom. And it's like this touching, heartfelt moment. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I love that. They have this nice embrace. And it's a... Uh, it's a nice little moment where Robin Williams like drops the comedy for a second, which is this is where Robin Williams knows how to just like go for the gut because he gets you with the comedy at first. And then once he takes it down to like a more dramatic moment, you're yes. like, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting yeah. that. That, <laughs> that kind of hit me. One of the few yeah. comedians who could be so intensely hilarious but also and then bring the very heart. good and yeah, serious bring the heart. roles. Yeah. Yeah. And he even made, makes that shine through in an animated character, which uh, that's credit to the animators and him, uh, just creating that perfect marriage of, of uh, you know character and uh, animation. Yeah, good job. <laughs> to, me, yeah, I was like, <laughs> to me, I was like, dude, do you have to leave? Yeah. Well, what? I know. You well, could stay. You could now give infinite wishes. You could. And who knows what happens in the following movies. Um, but what I really I think is... <laughs> I, I I watched them too growing up. I remember and the animated. I, I like series. John Reese Davies. Um, I also like in this moment though. Um, this is the first time that the genie actually does a Robin Williams impression. If you didn't know, really, yeah. I didn't know that. So there's a, a moment where he's going through, you know, all these uh, packing his bag and everything, and he it shows him wearing that yellow and red sort of striped shirt with the goofy hat goofy that he's hat. wearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he says he's going to Disney World kind of thing. Oh. Um, that there was an actual video of him that he recorded for a uh, Disney World. I don't know if it was for a ride or if it was just for a promotional thing, but he's wearing that exact outfit in a, oh, that's uh, awesome. in a Disney thing. So that's he's cool. referencing himself in that moment. That's, that's so cool. cool. Yeah, love love the ending to this movie. Heart heartfelt. Oh, like er every good Disney movie can be. By the way, Genie is just about the only character, in my opinion, that should ever break that anachronistic wall, wall of uh you know pop culture yeah but... he's the only one because he kind of transcends that and, and uh, david medium. and i were talking about this because yeah uh in tarzan i had a problem with it mm. where it was like and i think what it comes down to is robin williams is just an enigma for me where he's and for one he's a cosmic being of yes. time and space That's he can reach into the future reach into yep. the past he's not of the like the thing is none of the other characters break that Mm -hmm. that immersion it's just the genie who comes out out there and is just like so much at once where we're, yeah. when aladdin thinks he's hit his head when he first talks to <laughs> he's he probably has no idea what these references are yeah like aladdin acknowledges that this this guy is weird and the way he's speaking is not how anyone else does uh it doesn't work in tarzan for me because it's just it's it's well, they're, it's they're in the wild and they're monkeys, and like, that's about it. We're not talking Tarzan. We get it. It's, I know. It's, and I think I would agree completely that this, I think Aladdin does it better than any other movie. Yeah. I mean, it's I, impossible I, see, to not love. I, I'm not often bothered by it. It really depends on the movie. I wasn't bothered by it with Tarzan, but this one, it is one of the ones where, strangely, it kind of adds to his character to have that. Oh, it definitely does. Uh, uh all right, so that is the end of the story. One last thing I did want to bring up, uh, but this is one of those movies that before we had this big movement to get people, the right people to play the right roles, where you, we do have a full-on uh, white cast voicing every single one of these people. Something that I do think the, the one thing the remake did better than this was actually showing some sort of representation of that actual culture, even though that Not movie was lack still of directed controversy. by... Yeah. Um, but I do think it's worth noting uh, that maybe that it's so weird, though, because I think since we've gr grown up with these movies, these vo the voices of these characters are so ingrained in our minds as like the right voices for the character. Uh, so, like, I, I don't know if it would be a sacrifice to the art to like, you know, you brought up anachronism, um, you know, his Aladdin's like kind of parachute pants were not inspired by, you know, the dress of the time is inspired by MC Hammer. So, yep. come on. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it was. Yep. I did not know That's that. That's interesting. I didn't know that either. I Yeah, yeah I, I didn't know that. I, I think this was just like an awkward, it was an awkward stage for Disney where they were trying to do the right thing, but they just weren't going far enough. This is a contra controversial, complicated subject to, to distill. I mean, there's elements of, you know, what people know at the time and about whatever, social sentiment, but... 
Yeah, and every culture has characters of themselves. I mean, even yeah. in America, you've got you know what rednecks and stereotypical depictions and what what not. And I mean, you go <laughs> and uh, Agrabah. Birds. Yeah, Agra. Agra <laughs> very good point. Agrabah mm. is not a uh, real place, obviously, and it's kind of an amalgam of you know India, Pakistan, um, Saudi Arabia, or modern day Saudi Arabia. So it's kind of this whole South Asia. Middle East amalgam, and you know, obviously, the story takes place in or a Chinese-based origin. Well, wasn't the original when they were making this movie? They were going to base it off of Baghdad in Iran. Yeah, Iraq. And Iraq. I mean, there yeah. it's it's. I mean, there's sociopolitical things too. I mean, even Iran is totally different today than it was in the 80s. So, oh yeah, there I, it's. I don't know. Well, We're probably up too big a can of worms to well, go yeah. into. Fun fact, Agraba is an anagram for Baghdad. Yeah. Yeah, they they, yeah. they had to change the name and change the 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 storyline around it because I believe that was when we were having issues with that uh area of the world. And we're like, let's not draw yeah. any more attention to it. And pull out yeah. the D, so anyway, it is what it is. It's Disney going through growing pains, not quite there yet, but making progress, I would say. Uh it's still not quite uh, there yet, a, but on a positive closer. note. Basically, introduces you know kind of outside worldly culture to children, I guess of yes. that might not otherwise be exposed to it, which you know is an inherently good thing. Um, I True. would think. True. Um, all right. Just wanted to address that real quick, just because I wanted. It'll, to it's a it's a topic permit. that would come up, and I mean, yeah. how many people would know that you know Beauty and the Beast takes place in France? Right. Not not yeah. many people, unless someone told you that. True. <laughs> I actually even thought about it. Um, all right. Thus ends our discussions on this story of Aladdin. We're going to take a quick break, and on the other end, we're going to get in, we're going to get into our brief reviews with numbered scores, along with some box office, some uh, what critics thought, and we're going to close it out with a little franchise talk, as we normally do. So we'll see y'all then. Welcome back. Let's review Aladdin. Aladdin! Oh, he's coming in with a different energy. I'm trying. All right. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, I watched the right thing this time. You say Aladdin, I say how high. <laughs> is Wait. that the word? It could be. Jump is the word. Uh, yeah, I, I always mess up my idioms. I, I watched <laughs> Aladdin. Aren't you proud of me? I am I'm proud of you. So that's proud. that's a first. You you needed some sort of. Badge. I think it just speaks to how much this movie means to me. Mm. You were, you're like, I could have watched something stupid or silly, but instead, you're gonna watch the movie of your childhood. I mean, yeah. Didn't y'all see his review? Honestly, what would you have rhymed with Aladdin? Like, there's not a lot out there. Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, that was one of them. Or um, what was the other one? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, David, you want to pull those scores at random? I will. It was like Paddington Bear or something. <laughs> Paddington. <laughs> it's even more of a stretch. First up is a Reese. Is a Reese. A specific, it could be any Reese. <laughs> <laughs> is Reese with a nine. Hey. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. I'm going to keep it at that. All right, moving on. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. You stole uh, my, <laughs> all right. you, you stole my bit. <laughs> no, this is, a. Uh, it's a classic. Like it's har it's really hard to actually analyze this movie under a different lens because I I feel like I know it so well like every frame of it. Um, very little to criticize about it. I I love the animation. Uh, I love all the vo the vo vocal performances, both singing and just the the regular like a uh, voice act actor perform voice performances. This man, this is a rough episode for me, but I'm trying, guys. I promise. Um, yeah, it, it's just, there's not an ounce of fat on this movie. Every scene is intentional and in service of the plot or to build character. Um, my only issues are, are with it, and there are very few, and they're very much just nitpicks, is that I don't think the movie fully comes to life until Robin Williams enters the scene. So there's a good 30, 30 minutes where it's like, you know, it's moving at a nice clip, 
and it's fully intentional to to it, it, it's an intentional choice but i i'm still like as i was rewatching this and it had been a long time i was a little ever so slightly underwhelmed by the first 30 or so minutes before we get to robin williams uh but then once he gets in there it it, it lifts up to classic status just like i kind of thought it might um almost even more so like it, it's it, it it really shoots itself up into the upper echelon of 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 disney animated fare uh so it is probably still in like a, a top five disney for me uh but yeah th th just minor little nitpicks here and there i think some of the cgi is a bit dodgy this is when they're kind of going through an awkward phase of starting to implement cgi effects and while at certain times it looks great, like at the the uh, Cave of Wonders, the, the actual lion head, I think, is C partially CGI and also partially pra or, uh, mm -hmm. hand drawn. That looks mostly great. It's just some of those moments, like during the action sequences and, and some of the carpet moments that don't quite look all there. But I know that's also it's a product of 1992. But I think there's other movies that came out around that time, animated films that that integrate a little better. Um but yeah, it, it's a classic. I love this movie. Top five Disney animated. Uh, very little to complain about. And yeah, nine. All right. Next up is David. Myself. Also with a nine. So this is one of those movies that I, I was, you know, expecting to, to give a 10 to <laughs> coming in because I am just a fiend for, you know, nostalgia. Um, this movie didn't quite land the same way as my childhood, you know, kind of, you know, made it stay in my head. I don't know. I can't find words, but it, there is such heart and charm in this movie that, I mean, it's got a timeless nature to it for me, at least. Uh, and I do find new things every time I watch it, which is kind of crazy. I mean, after it being out for what, like nearly 30 years, mm -hmm. oh, just about. I mean, I can still find something new. And um, even though I've seen it twice already, I mean, even having it on in the background, sorry, I should say twice this week. Not I was about to say. <laughs> twice ever. I've only seen it twice in my <laughs> entire life. Yeah, twice this week. Um, just having it on in the background, I can't, I, I'm really trying to like pull myself away from looking at it because it's just so much freaking fun to watch. Um, so I'm going to bump mine up to a 9.5. Just talking about it is like, I want to watch it again now for a fourth time. Like it's, it's got that rewatchability factor that I always talk about. Uh, Robin Williams is one of my all-time favorite actors and comedians. He steals the show. He brings everyone else up. And it's a, such a fun movie, a Disney classic. So, 9.5. All right. Mm, such a yeah. fun you mentioned rewatchability. Classic. Oh, yeah. Very rewatchable. Yeah. I mean... Oh, like another not movie. A, not as rewatchable as the movie I have hung up on my wall right now. Wait, I don't have what, what movie I don't have that? an Aladdin poster in here, do I? What what movie is no, hung don't. up on your wall? <laughs> I have uh, the Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, the Blu-ray uh, box. Can't get enough of those Yetis Wait. playing football. Yeah. That. <laughs> 7.0 oh, is what I gave that. All right. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> Irina with a 9.5 as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, I... Still stand by that. I think that a lot of this is from nostalgia as well. But at the same time, it's just such a well-crafted movie. It doesn't overstay its welcome either. It transitions into each part of the story very fluidly. But um, I think one of the only flaws I would strike against it is there is there are kind of like a plot holes, I, I guess, that are sort of overlooked or you feel like you didn't really have a good answer for. And one of them being like, why, why did they focus on Aladdin in the first place when they captured him in the very beginning? Or, you know, just little things like that that seem sort of contrived to just move the plot along. There, there's also that little weirdness about Aladdin being able to trick the genie into doing it, but then... Well, why can't he do it of his own volition? Uh, the genie can't yeah. do stuff of his own volition? Yeah. Like, Th things like that. Where because it's, it's if, like that it's just a, if that flies, I think why there, doesn't it fly I think you later? can find ways around that one specifically. Well, well, think about it. I think the fact that he truly did believe he did make a wish. Yeah. I, I think he... But, but if he can just do it... Yes, but I think... Why? I think there's still rules. I think the rules are around whether or not he actually truly Who makes believes. the rules? 
<laughs> I'm sure we can Serene, figure that out. Serena's review. I'm sorry. That. I was no, just it's okay. Saying. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of that is mostly because the focus was having Robin Williams involved. And when you have a character like this, it's very difficult to try and connect all the points in a perfect way. So this movie is more about mood and ambiance than it is about telling the perfect story ever you know like it's it's definitely a mood film mm. and it's also a family movie yeah kids it is movie. it's a kids movie but um i think that's the only reason i'm not giving it a 10 because there are examples of 10s out there that did push that limit mm -hmm. for children's films particularly in animation and so it's it's in my mind nearly perfect there right. it is. Nearly perfect. And moving on to the next person here, Noah with a 9.0. Mm. That's me. And uh, yeah, I agree with Irina word for word. Wow, not even a single word different. Well, my words were different, but I agree with her word for word. Ah, okay. I, did, I just didn't know if you had any additional words as well. As not well as, really. Okay. It would be superfluous. All righty. 9.0. <laughs> right, last but not least, we have AJ with an 11. Are we? I, can we have that? Can we? Can we put an 11 in the books? Yeah. So obviously that's not allowed. Uh, so it. we'll say officially a 10. Um, now, nostalgia. We've talked about a few times, and I guess Very I'll have recently, my cake. And, actually, yeah. Yeah, I'll have my cake and eat it too. But this is so steeped in nostalgia for me. It's impossible to remove. You know. And I'm not going to even try. I mean, I, I did try to, you know, view this critically. Um, but, you know, as far as my background and history with this movie, I mean, I'm so steeped. In, I mean, watch this several times, The both direct-to-video sequels, the se animated series, you know. I think I had the video game on Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Had Aladdin lunchboxes, like, everything <laughs> Aladdin. <laughs> you were all much in. Much more, cult like, culturally, everything. Anyway... So, to extract yourself from that is almost impossible. Yeah, I would agree. But I think David said it, or Reese, um, you know, all this kind of boils down to is is heart. Um, mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. something that obviously kind of has a commercial slant to it, especially with, you know, the background history of it and Robin Williams and Disney and Eisner and Katzenberg, all that stuff. I mean, that kind of soils its reputation, unfortunately, a little bit, and that's the pretty much the main negative I have with this um, is kind of that drama behind the scenes. Disney right. being um, Disney. But I think that's even to, stronger to this credit of this movie and the production and the direction of, you know, uh, the team, the directors and, you know, the artists that animated it and everything. Yes, there are technical flaws that are, are noticeable, but all of that comes together to provide a very strong story with very strong characters important to me you know mm -hmm. jasmine is not a we said damsel in distress she's a strong um character in her own right aladdin has actual growth and is fun jafar top one of the top villains of all time and they do the dynamic between protagonist antagonist excellently i mean it is b very high in my book having a strong villain supplying um, reference for a growth of a protagonist. Um, that's something that's always been important to me, and I think this movie exemplifies that. And then obviously Robin Williams, the genie factor. Um, and as Irina said, it's very dangerous to say we're creating this movie based on this comic, this celebrity, and obviously there are multitudes of failures with that approach. Just the fact alone that they did that, they did it so well, and mm -hmm. it wasn't just this giant commercial thing that came across on screen, although they did that, you know, with merch and everything else. But that that heart shown through of right. the relationship between Aladdin and, and Genie um, and, you know, Jasmine. And I guess the weakest character would be Sultan, but even he has his own, you know, reasons for being there and how he is. Right. So I think all of that itself is, is strong enough motivation for, you know, kind of putting the nostalgia aside and still saying this is a perfect movie in my book, um, especially for being easily watchable, digestible, 
I mean, the vibrancy of the of the pop and color dynamic, Pacing. the soundtrack alone is one of the best soundtracks of any movies. And just it's it speaks to the credit of you know, Whole New World is so iconic and to the point of you know a negative because you hear it all the time. But that's how powerful it was originally. And there's this magic that is brought to this movie, you know, because of Robin Williams and and the whole cast and and crew and production, everything um, that speaks to a child and still speaks to the adult me. Mm. I I agree with all that. And there's a whole bunch of people that definitely agree that this is like a a 10 out of 10 movie, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. We're between 9 and 10 across the board here, so... Uh, all right, AJ, you want to crunch those numbers for us? All right, so group average for Aladdin, the original animated 1992 film, is a 9.4. And we've got a few of those, so we've got Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, for a few dollars more, Die Hard, uh, also Tarzan, the um, animated 99 movie, King Kong, and then now we have Aladdin. All those are 9.4 movies, and that's... Wow. Uh, Pretty good company. You've been good company, <laughs> Wait, right? So there. in the past month, we've given three a lot movies of at nine point four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, we've, they've we've been, been pretty good. high lately. We need to start picking some stinkers in our mini series. No, I think we get tired of talking about bland ones, and we're like, we want to talk about some good movies. I know, totally, which is totally fair. Well, some audience members seem to really gravitate towards you know talking well about a movie instead of oh, just yeah. completely destroying something. Yeah. Positivity always goes far. Which is why I'll never forget Soldier. <laughs> or The Mummy. Or Never Ending Story 2. <laughs> or or John Carter. The, the <clears throat> Spider's Web. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to critics. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has a 95% with an audience score of 92%. We're right in there, boys. Yep. We uh, are right between those numbers. And girls. Uh, on Metacritic, it has a 86 with an audience score of 8.7. That's high for Metacritic. Yeah. And on IMDb, it has an 8.0. Yeah, universally loved movie. There's a few you know weirdos out there that rated it negatively, but for the most part, this is a movie you can probably walk up to anybody, ask, hey, you like Aladdin? And uh, they're probably like, oh yeah, I love Aladdin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they'll know what you're talking about. It's not going to be like David, who asks people if they like The Legend of Tarzan. Uh, <laughs> I don't like The Legend of Tarzan? Um, I mean, just the font alone, the style of the typeface, the Aladdin, like, just oh yeah, that instantly itself recognizable. is magical. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so this, this, again, so many silhouettes, too, in this movie. All the characters look different. You see, you just see them out in the wild, and you're, you're instantly recognizable. All right, box office. This movie released on November 27th in 1992. This is the second uh, Thanksgiving uh, Robin Williams release. Uh, Mrs. Doubtfire was also a uh, Thanksgiving time release at, at the year right after this. Mm-hmm. So this was 92. Doubtfire was 93. Uh, also releasing in theater or playing in theaters at the time uh, were uh, Home Alone 2, The Bodyguard, Dracula. That uh, That's the, uh, oh my gosh. You know who I'm talking about. Was that about. the one with Gary Oldman? Yeah, the in Gary it? Oldman yeah. one. And uh, Malcolm X. So, what did this movie make worldwide? I'm going to start with. Are we doing David. inflated? Uh, this is not inflated. I'm just going to go. Right. I'm also recusing myself because I know it already. Okay. What so, was... AJ is out. Not inflated. And. Oh, you want to know the budget? Yeah. Isn't Budgeted like at 30? 20. 28 million. Oh, that's so low. That's pretty pretty high 92. for I mean, for that year. It's 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 actually mid mid budget animation. It's not super high. Uh in, even with inflation included. Like that's not insanely expensive. That's actually pretty low. All right, with the budget, what worldwide what do y'all think this did, David? Am I can I ask what uh Beauty and the Beast did? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, six hundred million. All right. Uh, Noah. Three hundred. Um, no, million, I should say. <laughs> no, three hundred dollars. Three hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, Irina. Uh, let's let's go five hundred. 
Five hundred and Arena, you're right on the dot, pretty much. What? No. Yeah, the movie made five hundred and four million. Whoa! Yeah. Cheater. The, the, I did not cheat. <laughs> how, how much did Tarzan do? Yeah, you're Reese, asking me you're these the questions your that Come I don't on. have off the well, top. Well, I mean, well, we did the like Beast was a budget recently. of twenty-five million. Box office four forty. Yeah, this one beat Beauty and the Beast. I guess you could attribute Disney's success from those movies to why this one did so well. I want to say Tarzan did something in like 300 to 400. Mm-hmm. So 400 budget maybe. of Tarzan, 130, and box office was about 450. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they air around 500. Yeah, but for Aladdin to make 500 million yeah, off, of a, that's a lot. off of a $28 million budget in 1992, that is massive. That's like an over billion dollar movie today. Uh, so yeah, people were loving themselves some Aladdin. Huge success. And we get a sequel. Yes. Uh, so this wasn't the first movie to have direct to DVD sequels, but it was one of the earlier VHS. ones. Uh, yes. Uh, direct to VHS. You're right. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> um, yeah. This movie had two direct to DVD sequels, uh, which was just a big thing. And and I didn't understand why Disney did this until I actually researched it. But DVD or sorry, VHS sequels, all these direct to home video movies were made a huge amount of money. They made mm-hmm. a yeah. lot. Um, I still feel like Disney was leaving money on the table though, because essentially their releases would, they'd be too, it'd be two big waves of cash. You'd have the theatrical release, which would make a ton of money. And then you'd have your second wave, which is the home video release. Uh, but these home video movies were much easier to put together and a lot cheaper. So you could get them out a lot quickly, capitalize on that, uh, you know, the, the wave of popularity that is still high from the, uh, the original release. So there's kind of a give and take there. So I kind of get where they're coming from doing it, but I'm like, why not just go all in and make an actual sequel? But uh, yeah, the first sequel was Return to Jafar, which came out two years later in 1994, uh, which was kind of a, served as a pilot of sorts to the Aladdin TV show. Um, That's not all though. There was actually a second direct to video sequel called uh that would be a third reese a third well second sequel i said a second sequel it's just a weird way of phrasing it i guess yeah uh called aladdin and the king of thieves uh which robin williams actually returned for for a nice sum of cash i think he got actually five million for that uh which is it seems like a lot for a direct-to-video like probably one of the highest amounts an actor's made for a direct-to-video one million dollar picasso painting yeah (laughs) well that's for the yeah that was to kind of you know, mend bridges uh, with uh, Robin Williams for the first movie. Apparently, it didn't work with his uh, room or his uh, aesthetic, though, or his feng shui. So he did not actually like the Picasso. Oh painting. my gosh! Um, well, well, it was also still the moral kind of. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, and the he made more in that movie, like more than quintuple, maybe septuple than he made in the original Aladdin. Yeah, yeah. He took a Screen Actors Guild budget in the first one. Yep, uh, but th- this is one of those another one of those cases where, you know, th- there is technically an Aladdin franchise because we have these direct-to-video sequels that are, I guess, canon. Uh, so it, it, but it, it just, I can't help but feel that Disney's was just kind of shooting themselves in the foot a little bit. Like, I feel like if they had taken the time, put in the money, and made an honest, good sequel, uh, it would have been more. I, I don't know, a better franchise. But then again, also then maybe we wouldn't have gotten some of those Disney Renaissance movies that we love. Lion King you know? came out in 94, right? So yeah, what if the, a sequel to Aladdin killed Lion King? It could have you know? been. Uh, so been. maybe I'm, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe I'm glad I'm, maybe I'm happy about where the cards fell. Yeah, be happy with what we got. Yeah. Like, we have Frozen 2. What could have been in that place? Uh, who knows? I don't know. I, I, I kind of like Frozen 2. But yeah, that, that's not the end of Aladdin, though. We obviously have the live-action remake that we've already discussed, and that movie uh, was immensely successful, made over a billion dollars, and is setting up its own. Like, they're writing a sequel for that one. Like, we are going to have a Aladdin sequel, live-action, which, hey, they don't have anything to base it off of, unless they actually take these direct-to-video... Return of Jafar. I don't think they're going to do that, though. No, they, no, they they couldn't. So I'm I am kind of curious. I'm like, okay, where do they go from here? Um, so we'll see with that. But that's kind of where Aladdin as a franchise stands. It's uh not gonna be getting any animated sequels at all ever. Uh, 
well, I won't say ever, but the, the, the original franchise as we know it of Aladdin is dead. Well, we're uh, never getting Robin Williams back for it. Well, yeah, true, obviously. Um, but yeah, we still have the uh, the good old live action to rely on for our our much needed Aladdin content. So it's it's not a dead franchise if you just take the Aladdin name as uh, the overarching property. yeah property. Yes, yeah, so you're right. Not a dead property, but a dead animated franchise. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's it for Aladdin. I haven't actually talked with you about what we're going to be talking about next week. Mm. So. David, what is it? Hook. Hook. Uh, another, another rock. Uh, in fact, actually, this miniseries is all of these miniseries are just one-offs. By the yeah, way, yeah, they are. None of we're we're not talking about any sequels in this whole miniseries. So it's just here we go on to the next Robin Williams property. Well, it's kind of like uh, what I did in my last series. I feel like I'm a one-off kind of guy. Yeah, I don't like saying that. I'm not going to take that. Well, out. you did Pirates <laughs> of the Caribbean, which was. All sequels. Yes, but before this, <laughs> I did the animated Dark Horse series. I know, I know. So. You like your Disney, too. That's a running theme. Um, all right, yep. Again, next week, we're talking about Steven Spielberg's Hook. Hook. All right, we will see y'all later. Bye. He's got the monkeys. Let's see the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs>